Are you having a happy Sabbath this morning? Amen. And it's just a blessing to hear those boys sing. Amen. They sounded better than the first time I heard them sing it. And uh, I, just, I love hearing our students sing. It's, it's such an incredible blessing. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for showing us who you are and for drawing us such under mortals, but you've placed a value on us that is beyond all computation, and all you ask for in return is our heart. Please help us to give it to you. Please forgive us for our sins, and please flood this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit that the words I speak are not mine but yours, and that we may understand not just with our ears but with our hearts. In your name, amen. <clears throat> Some of you may remember this story. It was going to be my conclusion, but it's going to be my introduction instead. You may remember it from the special feature last week. And it's about a lady that's called, in the story, Catherine. And she was from a wealthy family in Europe. She had she'd been in the United States for many years. She had been through a couple of unfortunate marriages. And with everything she had been through, even her current marriage was in trouble. She was having a bleeding ulcer problem. Now, that is not an easy thing to recover from, but she was going through, uh, I believe she was at one of our sanitariums, and she was going through the process to try and receive healing. But in, in everything she did, all the treatments, all the counseling, everything, nothing was making that ulcer better. And the doctor said to her, Catherine, you've worked so hard your problems. Is there anything else that might be troubling you? And she says, I can't think of a single thing. And her doctor was getting ready to schedule her for surgery. And in the middle of the night, he was called to her room. But she was pacing uh, violently, the story says, back and forth. Her hands were clenched, and she was just hissing, I hate her. Her doctor said, Catherine, whom do you hate and why? And he waited patiently, and eventually she told him. See, her grandparents were European nobility. Uh, their only son had a child out of wedlock, and that was Catherine. Now, her grandfather truly loved her, but her grandmother openly resented this poor child. And for years, they had no communication. And just that night, her grandmother called and says, your grandfather is dead, and it's your fault. You killed him. She says, I killed him. How? And her grandmother says, because you left the faith of your family and you espoused another religion. And, and that, of course, reopened all the pain, all the suffering she had been through. And so Catherine was dealing with all that anger and all that resentment. And, and, but after a lot of prayer, a lot of counsel, she was able to forgive her grandmother. And not only that, but write her a loving letter of forgiveness. And on top of that, her ulcer healed completely without surgery. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 5. And this is where we see the story of the man that was paralyzed for 38 years. And it says, uh, starting in verse 2. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, but to having five churches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, and, and others, waiting for the moving of the water. Because the common belief, as verse 4 says, was that an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in and was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity, thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that how he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, this guy had no idea who Jesus was. He didn't know the Messiah had arrived. He, he, he didn't know him from Adam, as the saying goes. And so, I, I have to wonder what this man was thinking. You know, for maybe a split second he was thinking, maybe I'm going to get healing today. And then he remembers, 
I can't get to the pool. And my friends are never here when the water is troubled, so what's the point in trying? In verse 7, the impotent man answers and says, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. The uh, a Bible commentary that I was looking at, I, I can't remember which one, but it says, The pathetic reply of the afflicted man lays bare a story of physical misery, of desertion by his friends, of the repeated revival of hope, followed each time by bitter disappointment. At this point in the narrative, his hope was still centered on the supposedly miraculous pool. Apparently, it had not yet occurred to him that Jesus could heal him by other means. So, you know, if, if you are suffering some ailment and someone comes up to you and says, do you want to be made whole? You know, what is the obvious answer? You know, of course. Of course I want to be made whole. Most people are going to be the answer. I don't want to live this suffering. Most of us would respond. So why ask the obvious? Well, by asking the obvious, Jesus was trying to uh, create in this man's heart a desire for healing. How many of us would desire healing if we didn't think it was possible? You know, this man had been repeatedly through the, this, this struggle of the water's troubled, but where are my friends? And, and even if his friends were there, the, the desire of ages gives us the, the description of this. It was such a madness that as soon as the water was troubled, people would literally trample each other, resulting oftentimes in death of other people. And so this man's hopes are disappointed again and again. You know, have you ever been, maybe, for example, we use depression. Have you ever been through the depression that every once in a while you get this glimmer of hope and then squashed? And, and after so many times of that, you're just, you know, I, why bother? I, I get this glimmer of hope and then I'm back in the same, this same uh, cesspool. It's just, I give up, why bother? And this is where this man was. But Jesus wanted to make this man understand that he could heal him. But he had to introduce things first. He had to revive that hope for healing. If you don't want something, are you going to try and get it? So Jesus comes up to this man and he says, will you be made whole? No introduction, no, I'm the Messiah, I'm here to heal you. No, what's your name, how you been? Just, do you want to be made well? And so, what I find interesting about these words, see, I love to study the Greek, and so I find a lot of parallels that way. And so, for the word for be made, in grammatical Greek, it's, the way it's translated is, it's the man performing an action upon himself. You know, um, I, I'm a teacher, Anthony. If I say, do you want a good grade, what does that mean you need to do? Study. You need to study. You need to do something. You need to show that initiative. And so the word literally means to come into existence, to, um, to be performed, to, become, to be made. He's not just asking this man, do you want to be made whole? He's asking, do you want to be made new? He's alluding to the fact in a few, in a couple of decades after that, the Apostle Paul wrote the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, not the old one with a few modifications. He is a brand new creature. Um, and another one where Paul wrote, For by grace are you saved, in Ephesians chapter 2, and that not of yourselves. This man had to understand that he could not heal himself, but there was a source of healing. You know, it, it reminds me of the story in Numbers chapter 21. You know the story, um, they're in the desert. Uh, they're complaining for what seemed probably like the five billionth time. And God says, okay, fine. I'm going to teach you a lesson. I don't want to do this, but I've got to teach you a lesson. And he withdrew his protection, and all these venomous serpents came in. Now, as a snake guy, I like studying snakes. And in that part of the world, there's very, very venomous snakes. Some of them are so good at camouflage that 
you know, for example, you could set them here and you'd never know they were here. There's some that can um, uh, dig themselves in the sand and you'd never see it until it's too late. So if you happen to be a lizard, well, that's, sorry, that's the end of you. This is the kind of snakes that were in that part of the world. And so death would come fairly rapidly. So all these fiery serpents, as, as Numbers 21 puts it, came in, and a lot of people died. And, and Israel realized how they had sinned. And so they're coming to Moses, and they say, we've sinned. Please, please do something. And God says, all right, make a brazen serpent, a bronze serpent. Put it upon a pole so anybody who looks at it will be healed. And anybody who looked at that serpent on the pole was instantly healed. Those who didn't died. And so God is showing us in this story here that we need to look to Jesus for healing. I mean, how many times have you tried something else to find comfort from your pain? Some people, like our, the woman in our story, they've um, suffered abuse. And then years later, because of all that hidden resentment, they start suffering physical health problems. Or maybe because of all that hidden abuse in the past, they, they turn to addictions to try and numb the pain. It happens far more than we realize, even in the church. You see, this man, when, God, when Jesus said, do you want to be made whole, he was beginning to realize that it was possible. And the word for whole doesn't just mean health. It means um, a sound, uh, sound in body, to restore to health, to um, um, strong defines it also as to be made well in body, figuratively to be made true in doctrine. So this is a pattern that repeats itself in Scripture. Jesus comes to somebody and says, do you want to be made whole? And the answer many times was yes. And he says, okay, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And why does he say go in peace? Well, so many of us have these histories, these, 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 this history of sin. For whatever reason, we've lived in sin for so many years. And then God says, it is not my will for you to live in sin anymore. I forgive you. Go in peace. Because if we don't go in peace, it's only a matter of time before, one, we return back to that vomit, and two, we start suffering some kind of health problem because of it. So Jesus doesn't even enter into a debate with this guy. The guy gives some excuse, and Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the excuse. He just says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, rise. It's translated again as performing the action upon himself. But not just that, it's an imperative. It's, it's a command for my, for my grammar friends. An imperative is a command. So Jesus says in a commanding way, rise. Do you want healing? Well, then rise. See, uh, he, he leaves the choice up to us, but he still gives us that command. He offers us salvation, but he's not going to force us to accept it. To, to this word for rise, it means to, to rise from sleep. It, it, not just that, it means to awake or to arouse from the sleep of death or, or to construct uh, spoken of buildings, but that's God's desire is to reconstruct us, to renew us. So God today is calling us to a life to rise from our sleep, to rise from our spiritual lethargy. You know, there's a reason Revelation 3 calls us a warm church. Because most of us just come in, we put in our dues for three hours on Sabbath, and, and we think that's good enough. But in our heart of hearts, we realize that it's not. And Jesus is telling us here, rise up from your spiritual Laodicean state. Wake up. There was a, there's a story I heard in a sermon by Wes Peppers. Um, he's a pastor up in Michigan, uh, last I heard. And um, there was this young man, I believe it was in the Ukraine. And over there, apparently it was tradition to 
that when you graduate that your parents will give you something. And for this young man, this particular young man, he went to his parents, and his dad was a pastor. He says, all right, mom and dad, all my friends are getting cars, money, and all this other stuff. What are you going to give me? You know, I'm about to graduate. You should give me something. And they said, um, well, we, we don't have much money. All we have is this apartment. And he says, I want it, or I'm going to kill you. And the parents said, OK, we'll move somewhere else. You can have this apartment. So the young man began throwing parties and, and uh, with his friends and living the prodigal life. You know, um, One night after his friends had gone, and a true story, by the way, he lit up a cigarette. And as he went to smoke that cigarette, his door started glowing. And this shining, glowing being walked through that door. And he comes to this young man, and he says, if only you understood what you're doing. If only you understood what you're doing to my heart. If only you understood how close we are to the end, because I'm coming soon. And he walked back through the door, and everything went back to normal. And the next week, that young man was back in church, and he gave his heart back to Christ. He obeyed the command to rise. Not just that, Jesus doesn't stop there. Sanctification is not a one-shot Johnny, it's a process. He says, take up, take up your bed. Now, this is also a command. And, and, and yes, it means take up, but also it also means um, to expiate sin, to atone for the guilt of sin. He wasn't just telling this man, take up your bed, and walk in newness of health. He was telling him, walk in newness of life. And he's telling us the same thing today. And he goes on to say, walk. For this man hadn't walked in nearly 40 years. I, I wonder what his thought was when Jesus said, walk, and this man was... Um, could he have been thinking, how is that possible? I haven't walked in 38 years. But no, he obeys his command. He gets up and he walks. In fact, Desire of Ages says Jesus had given this man no assurance of divine help. He might have stopped to doubt and lost his one chance of healing. But he believed Christ's word, and acting upon it, he received strength. That's the key is when Jesus tells us to get up and walk is to believe it. We cannot make ourselves good. And this man is a perfect illustration of we cannot do it ourselves. But Jesus can do it in us. If you will turn with me, we'll contrast this story with that of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. And here was a young man. He was wealthy. He had power. He was... He was in the Jewish leadership. And I don't know if he was old enough to be in the Sanhedrin, but he was in leadership. And, and he had everything. And he comes to Jesus. In verse 16 of Matthew 19, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice right away his focus is completely wrong. And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And it wasn't that Jesus was saying, why do you, you know, I'm not God. Jesus was saying, do you realize what you're calling me? Do you realize who I am? What I can do for you? So this young man, right away he's focused on what can I do? Not what can you do for me, what, how can you help me, what can I do? He, he didn't realize that, that um, as John 17 verse 3 says, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He wanted to earn heaven. He didn't want it as a gift. Because as a gift, it requires sacrifice. Jesus also said, keep the commandments. Now, what's interesting about this is the word for keep literally means to guard by keeping the eye upon. 
Now, if you do a study of the Ten Commandments, you'll see that every characteristic that describes the Ten Commandments is also used in the Scriptures to describe God. So the Ten Commandments are a transcript of His character. So what Jesus is saying here, keep your eyes on Him. That's the condition to eternal life. That will lead us to practical obedience. There's no possible way we can earn heaven. It's a gift. Now, the young man says, which ones? And Jesus says, well, thou shalt do no murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't do false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm, what I was thinking when I was studying this is why does this young man ask which? According to himself, he had kept everything. I think he knew he was missing something. In, in fact, the young man responds with, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? This word for lack is fascinating. It literally means to be inferior, to fall short, or to be deficient, to be destitute. He's asking Jesus, why? I've done all this. I've been to the church all my life. I'm at the synagogue every week. I'm leading. I'm doing scripture reading. Why am I still so destitute? Why am I still so empty? Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. More than that, according to Thayer's lexicon, it means to be left behind in the race, to fail to reach the goal. He knew something was missing. He had that self-righteousness, that self-confidence, but deep down, he, he knew something was missing. And he's asking Jesus, because by this point, Jesus has been around long enough. He has the reputation of being the Messiah, or at minimum, being some great you know, on this, like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. In Review and Herald, uh, February 28, 1882, paragraph 10, it says the great mass of mankind are engrossed in the things of this life, and divine truth can find no abiding place in their hearts. And yet all the blessings which the world can give fail to satisfy the wants of the soul. There is a nameless longing for something which they have not, a peace and rest that is not born of this earth. Christ of lost world, come unto me and drink. Isaiah 55 says, come, buy bread without price. And what does bread mean? It's the word of God. If, if you have your Bibles, you have the blueprint for salvation. You have everything you need to be saved in here. So Jesus says, if you will be perfect, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything. He, he was touching on the young man's eyes. You know, in, in the first story, in John 5, we have a man who wanted, desperately wanted healing. In the second story, we have a man who wanted healing, but wasn't ready, did not want to give up what separated him from God. And what does perfection mean? It means to be the, to experience the fullness of the character of God, and ultimately it means sinlessness. Now, right now we're not in that space, but it is righteousness by faith. Jesus says if you want to be righteous by faith, here's what you've got to do. Give up everything that comes in between me and you, and then come and follow me. It's idle with riches, and so Jesus says sell everything you have, give to the poor, and, and this young man is going out, oh, say what now? <laughs> You know, Justin, you and I are in really into photography and video and, and, and stuff like that. And what if Jesus comes to us and says, if you want to be my disciple, give it up? That would be hard, honestly. I'll be honest with you guys. I love media and to edit and stuff. But if Jesus says, give it up, then I pray for his grace to obey. And, of course, as we know the story, the, in verse 22, the young man heard that saying, he went I like the way the Amplified Version puts it. It says, But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, grieved, and in much distress, for he had great possessions. He was not willing to give up his idol. And it was not just any, you know, well, darn it. It wasn't that kind of sadness. It, it was deep sorrow. It was this man knew what he was up against. He knew what he needed to do. He knew what he wanted. 
but he wasn't willing to sacrifice. He wanted to retain his wealth, and he also wanted heaven. Wealth in itself is not a bad thing, but for this man it was an idol. Jesus asked him to give up the idol. And instead of giving that up, he decided to keep his wealth and forego eternal life completely. Jesus was looking on this young man, and he saw in him someone who, would, who could be a Peter or a Paul in his service. And how many of us, if we would give up our idols, could be a Peter or a Paul? You know, it's too often we come to church every week, and yet we do let the heavyweights do the lifting. You know, Mark Finley, he's going to go and do all his evangelism series. Dwayne Lemon, he's going to go do all this meditationary stuff. I don't know any of that. There's already people doing all this stuff. And we're not realizing, or at least we don't want to realize, that uh, to keep back anything from God is eternal death. We're, t- we're so in love with our sin, the way that Doug Bachelor said it, is that we... God tells us to flee from it, and yet we crawl away hoping it'll catch up, glancing back at it every once in a while, saying, hey, come here. Let's have fun like old times. That is not full surrender, beloved. Full surrender is I hate what God hates. And one final story before uh, our conclusion In Ezekiel 16, is a powerful, powerful story. And that could be applied to the church at large and also to us individually. Because God comes to us, and and as it says in Ezekiel 16, he sees us in our sinfulness, in our dirtiness, in in our, 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 uh, that that the world doesn't want us. The world will use you and spit you out. In verse 5 of Ezekiel 16, it says, No one pitied you uh, to have compassion on you, but you were cast out in the open field. Uh, Verse 6, But when I passed you by and saw you polluted in your own blood, I said unto you when you were in your blood, Live. Yea, I said unto you when you were in your blood, Live. Now, God sees the worst in us. He sees what we're addicted to. He sees what we struggle with. He he sees what we're not willing to give up. But he sees us also for what we can become. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that Jesus, when he looked at somebody, he didn't see them for what they were necessarily. He saw them for what he wanted to make them. You know, the devil will come to us and come to us and say, sinner, you don't deserve heaven. Look what you just did the other day. And, And he's right. However, we have a God who, just as he rebuked Satan when he went to resurrect Moses, will do the same for us because he wants to resurrect us spiritually. But it's only if we want it. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is... That's one of my favorite verses right there because it encapsulates the entire Bible. It's the entire reason that the Bible is written. And do we understand what that means? Read Romans 5 sometime. Don't just read it, but study it. Romans 4 also. Some of the most powerful chapters in the Bible I've ever studied. See, we weren't just here. We were enemies. Would you be willing to die for the person who hates you the most? Most of us wouldn't. We, we were in that space where we weren't just here. We weren't just sinners. We were, we were afraid of God. We hated God. And why? Because we didn't truly understand his. For most people, it worked. And that's why Jesus came, was to reveal the character of God. See, I believe Jesus says this to us individually many times. It's in Matthew 23, verse 37. And this is where he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered uh, your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not.
And in, 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 in Christ Object Lessons, page 149, it says, Let your heart break for the longing it has for God, for the living God. The life of Christ has shown what humanity can do by being partaker of the divine nature. All that Christ received from God, we too may have. Then ask and receive. With the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah, claim for yourself all that God has promised. See, our problem is that we've left our first love, and that's led us to so much pain and break. And, and as those of you who are here at prayer meeting on Wednesday night that Elder Benny uh, discussed with us, it was such a powerful message. And it, the, the thing is that sin has separated us from God. Isaiah 59, God cannot hear us if we cherish sin, and that's why he wants us to give up sin so that we can receive that healing. In Revelation 3, Jesus says to us as a church and as individuals, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel you to have me gold in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye self, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And how do we experience that healing? For everyone, it's going to look a little bit different. Some of us may need therapy. Some of us may just need to, to um, write a letter or something. Um, but the common theme for all of us is to spend that time gazing at Jesus. And how do we do that? Well, Bible study. We can't see him face to face, but we can see him in his word by faith. The Hebrews 11 says, they endured as seeing him who is invisible. Desire of Ages, page 280 says, man must be emptied of self before he can be in the fullest sense a believer in Jesus. When self is renounced, then the Lord can make man a new creature. New bottles can contain new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer in new life. In who looks unto the author and finisher of our faith, the character of Christ will be made manifest. Now, I'm going to divulge a little bit of my history here. I was at that place. I, I was at that place where... Jesus comes to me and says, do you want to be made well? No, Lord, I'd rather have my sin at this point. And because of that, I struggled with addictions. When I was four years old, I found my grandfather's Playboy, which led to an addiction years later. And praise the Lord, I am free from that addiction. But the fact is, I struggled with that addiction, and the Lord showed me one of the reasons I struggled not just with that, but with other things, was because I was medicating. I was self-medicating. If you've ever been to a recovery group, you learn, a lot of addicts learn that the reason we are addicted is because we are self-medicating the pain of past abuse. A few years ago, August 29, 2016, I lost my mom. And I'm convinced that if she would have lived healthier, she would still be. And I had to deal with the pain of that. And not just that, I had to deal with the pain of I had let myself become distanced from her. Have you ever gone through the pain of experiencing distance from someone and then they're gone? And you can't make right anymore. Not directly. And then a year later, exactly one year later, I lost my stepdad in a freak motorcycle accident. And those two things around those times, I, I, I threw nutrition to the wind of myself. And that's why I gained a, a lot of weight. And then I, I have to work on that now. Um, and that left me with scars. Now, with, with him it was different because I was not distanced from him. And so, 
but I, I not only had to deal with all of that emotional pain and baggage, I discovered things that I never knew about my mom that I not just had to deal, didn't just have to deal with the pain of losing her, I had to deal with the, my lack of desire to forgive her for these things. And, and because of those things, because of my healing from those things, it was affecting my family life. And, and, and God comes to me again and he says, do you want to be made whole? Yes, Lord. Desperately, yes. But I tried to do it on my own. And it wasn't working. The more I tried, the worse it got. And he comes to me again and he says, do you want to be made whole? Yes, Lord. Desperately, yes. What do I do? And then he showed me these things. And I began doing those things. And this joy that began to be restored. And the healing. Can I tell you how freeing it is that I don't have to deal with these things anymore? I don't have to be angry. I don't have to hurt. And it's all because of Jesus, nothing else. We can come to church every week, but unless you let him heal you, it's not going to do you any good. If anything, it will increase our condemnation. Our closing hymn, if, uh, where is Sylvia? If you'll, yeah, if you'll come up, is I surrender all. As we are going to the song and singing this song, it's number 309 in the hymnal. Don't just sing it blindly. Pray it. And it's okay if you don't feel it. God does not expect perfection at first. He will get us where he wants us in his own time and way. But as you're singing this song, please, where you're sitting, surrender so that you can be made whole. Hymn number 309. Want to be made whole? Surrender. 309, should we stand? <clears throat> Make me Savior, oh. 
to you this morning. No one Please help us to, to allow you to heal us and to allow you to use us in your service to bring others to the kingdom so that they can experience the joy you've given us. Please be with us as we go about your Sabbath and help us to find the joy in it and to keep it holy. In your name, amen. Amen.